Thank you. Very Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to, to speak today. It's a great um, pleasure to, to do that. Um, so in, in my talk, I'm going to talk a bit about um, data protection and IP and some things to think about. And what I want to do, I suppose, is um, build on the, the previous session um, where I think we've got some of the, the building blocks in terms of uh, data protection laws and intellectual property laws, and then think about how some of these apply in relation to projects involving the, the use of data. Uh, so what I'm going to cover today, um, a quick introduction to, to I suppose, some of the sort of key themes in relation to data. Um, th this stuff will be very familiar, I'm sure, to, to the audience, but just helpful just to go back to some basics there. And then look at what the, what rights there are in, in data, and say so this, this will build on, on the previous talk. And then look a little bit about uh, data stewardship, which is a, a bit of a hot topic, a, um, a phrase we're hearing a lot of at the moment. So what does that mean and what might that look like? And I'm then going to talk, and this will be the main part of the talk, I suppose, is looking at how you manage some of these risks in practice. And um, as I said in the introduction, I've, I've worked with a number of clients on data projects um, in both the, the public and the private sector involving data taken from various sources. So, you know, that might be, uh, say, in mapping information from the Orton Survey or information from the Met Office, and then other research sources and applying that data together, applying layers to it, sensor data, whatever, and then producing some sort of output. So based on my what you know, sort of work I've been doing there, I hope to share some some things you might want to think about when involved in, in data projects. And then as, as as we said, but we'll finish up at the end with with some questions. So I just want to start and, and, and these these are terms which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, but just you're know, looking at some of the terms we're talking about here. So when we're talking about big data, what are we talking about? Well, I've, I've got the, the Gartner definition here, which is always very handy to go to. And they talk about big data being high volume, high velocity, high variety of information, um, assets that demand cost-effective, innovative forms of information processing um, for enhanced insight and decision-making. So you're taking large amounts of data from lots of different sources, and that requires you to look at them in a different way. So there's clearly a lot of data out there and we can do lots of interesting things with it but part of the challenge is actually trying to work out where the interesting stuff is within that and, and what we can do with it if, if we do a bit of a comparison so you know traditional research you will have um, statistically representative samples you might have random sampling you might have narrow sources of of data and you'll be, be testing your hypothesis but when you're doing research based on on big data you're going to have far more data sources from lots of different areas and they may have different differing levels of um, information within that, different levels of accuracy or, or completeness or whatever. But you're looking at all the data that they are and you're you're trying to use algorithms to find find correlations within that data. And that in turn enables machine learning and AI and therefore hopefully being able to derive uh, some interesting um, information from that data to actually properly properly explore it and we'll look at what that means in the context of of ip in particular further on the, the other thing that we're you know is, is obviously a much bigger issue now is, is metadata so not just the data itself but actually the, the other data um that is associated with that and again you know, turn to the the gartner definition here so it's information that describes various facets of information asset um, to improve its usability throughout its life cycle um, and it's the metadata that turns information into an asset. It's the metadata definition that provides the understanding that unlocks the value of the data. So the metadata is what tells you about that information or that uh, um, piece of data to then actually understand that and how you can then look for the correlations with other data. So yeah, there's lots of examples here. If we go back a long, long time. You know, library catalogs are a classic example of that. Um, but meta tags and web pages, and um, we look at digital photos as one that we all know. But there's a huge amount of metadata embedded within a digital photo. So you've got exposure length, ISO rating, or you know, the geolocation data showing where that photo is taken. And when we're looking in, in the broader sense at sensors, then there's a whole lot of information that sensors will gather as well. And all of that, um, you know, th there are international standards out there which which deal with um, how metadata is is organised and, and sorted. And the important thing here again is looking at how because that can be created independently of the data to which it relates so yeah you, you can look at that metadata there, there may be separate ip in that it may belong to someone or been been added to by someone else and, and in terms of what analysis can be done in it again you may be able to create new information new data which 
in itself may, may create new IP. And then the final sort of theme I wanted to discover to start with was, was open data. Again, it's something we, we hear a lot about, but what, what do we mean by, by open data? And I, I looked here at the, the Open Knowledge Foundation. So they, they define open data as data that can be freely used or reused and redistributed by anyone. Um, and usually subject only to very minimal um, obligations around attribution and sharing on, on the same terms. So what do we mean by, by open data? Well, it doesn't mean there's no, no intellectual property rights in that, in that data. Um, it's just that what you can do with it, you're granted a far broader right to do that. Um, so I say open data is usually licensed on a basis that enables people to freely reuse that or to distribute it. So you can um, pass it on again or publish it, provided you, you acknowledge and attribute uh, the, original, the original source. But it's also important to remember that open data is generally distributed, a bit like open source software, on the basis that there's very little um, protection that you get in terms of being free from infringement of copyright or, or other intellectual property rights um, or accuracy or completeness. So it is a great source, but also it needs to be used with care and uh, just to be aware of the risk. Now, within the UK, we, we have um, regulations uh, that apply to, to the use of data held by public bodies. So we've got the reuse of public sector information regulations, um, and they set out the rules that apply to enabling access to uh, data sets held by public bodies in, in the UK. And this is different uh, for those of you that are familiar with freedom of information laws, this is a different set of legislation to freedom of information laws in particular. Uh, access to data may be subject to a license fee. It isn't necessarily going to be available for free. And information that's held by further and higher education institutions is also outside the scope of the, the 2015 regulations. Alongside that, we also have the INSPIRE regulations, which deal with spatial information that's held by, by public authorities as well, and the basis on which that is to be made available. And the UK government has a, a portal, data.gov.uk, which um, is designed to try and bring together the various sources of um, open data, data within the UK. Um, there's no, no restriction on commercial use of that. And in fact, actually, the, that's very much encouraged. So that the point of opening up access to data sets held by public bodies, and public bodies hold a, hold a huge amount of data, is to actually try and encourage innovation and to enable um, the commercial sector, uh, the private sector, to find new ways of using that data uh, on a commercial basis um, and um, making that work better for everyone. So in terms of licenses, so if, if you're looking to use um, particularly public, uh, so public sector data in the UK, the UK government has produced a couple of model licenses. Um, and the main one here is what's called the, the open government license. So for those of you, you that are familiar with things like Creative Commons, um, the, the open government license is a very similar model to that. And it is the, the default license that is expected to be used for um, data held by uh, public bodies, bodies in the UK. There's also a non-commercial variant of that as well, the, the non-commercial government license. And generally speaking, the expectation is that public bodies, uh, whether central government or um, other public bodies will will use the OGL to make available their data to, to third parties. Um, there are some exceptions to that. So um, if the provider is able to charge, then you can use the open, open government license. So take, for example, the Met Office, which um, uses uh, or has powers to commercially license its data. And that's where it gets its revenue for to, to do what it does. Um, similarly, there are uh, circumstances where bodies can limit the use of the data to non-commercial purposes, in which case the, the NCGL can be used. If the data set has personal data in it, then, then you can't use the OGL for that. And we'll talk a bit more about data protection issues uh, later on. Um, if there are third party rights that don't align with the, the OGL, uh, then, you, then you can't use the OGL there either. So say, for example, a public body has licensed in data from a third party, um, then its ability to license that out will be subject to the terms of the inbound license. So you can't grant broader rights to third party than you've got from the party that's licensed to you. So in that case, you mean a, a bespoke license. If there's patents or trademarks and design rights, um, then again, the, the OGL can, can, can be used. And then the final one is around software code. So 
there is an exception if there are particularly technical benefits of using another open source license and there are many uh, open source licenses out there for software um, then you can deviate from from the OGL and I've got a link there in the slides to the web page on the National Archive website which provides all the information on this licensing framework and if if you're involved in projects that are using data from uh, public sources and it's a really good starting point to understand I suppose what what you can and can't do with with the data and how the different models models work but the you know, the, the key thing about both the the OGL and the NCG is actually they are incredibly kind of easy to follow so they're, they're written in plain English they are barely a page long and um, they are very permissive in terms of what you can do with them um, but it is worth it if, if, if you're looking at a um, a project involving a uh, data source in the public sector then actually having having a look at that page okay so having covered those sort of basic themes I wanted then to look at um, what rights there are in data and say in this, I, I really want to just build on what, what was said in the previous talk and not go into too much detail on it before going on to some of the practical issues. But first off, and when, I, when I'm doing these talks, I always um, like to dispel one of the myths because people people quite often talk about owning data, um, and that's my data, and you, you know, I, I own that, and, and you don't own that. Well, you you can't really own data. Um, it's not something that you possess. It is something which you have rights in. But uh, different people can have different rights in the same the same information. So in, information on its own generally isn't owned. And indeed, you can't steal information. So it's a very interesting case. And this, this I promise you, I think, is the only the only bit of proper law I'm going to talk about, the only, the only case. But it's always an interesting one. Oxford v Moss, which was about a university student um, oh, about uh, just over 40 years ago who stole from uh, his professor's office um, the proof to uh, an exam question so the answer to the exam question and it was never in doubt that he was going to return that bit of paper he was just borrowing it to, to read what was on it and there was an attempt to um, prosecute him for theft and that that failed because the court said well you can't steal information you know you, you can steal the physical bit of paper but if you accept that he wasn't looking to uh, steal that bit of paper and was always going to put it back um, then then that can't succeed. So quite an interesting one in terms of, you know, just differentiating between what we call tangible assets, so paper and things like that, versus intangible assets, which are, you know, electronic files, information, things that you can't you can't actually touch. But while, while you, you can't own information, you can restrict use. So intellectual property laws grant you certain monopolies to use uh, certain information um, where they are protected by IP. Um, and data protection laws can also uh, limit what someone can you do with information where that contains personal data. And lastly, there's also uh, the law of confidentiality. Um, so you may have a duty of confidentiality in relation to information, and that might be implied by law because the information is, is has the necessary qualities of confidentiality to create that obligation of confidence. Or it might be through contract that you write into a contract saying, this information is confidential and you will not disclose it to, to any other person. Okay, so when, when we're looking at rights and data, I've got my, my little diagram for database here. So within the, um, the IP laws apply in different ways. So we've got the database structure, which might be protected by copyright, might be protected by confident information. And then we've got the contents of the database itself which are protected by different rights. So there may be database rights in that, there may be copyright in that, there may be privacy rights under data protection law, and there may be confidential information. And then in terms of, and I'm not going to talk into this detail because I know that was covered in the previous talk, um, but in terms of sources, we might have new research, new, uh, new things that are created. We might have automatically generated data. So that might be data that comes from a, a sensor or through some analysis or something like that. Um, we might have data that's provided by um, partners in the project, um, so they're licensing data into that. And we might have information um, which is already in the public domain. So you can see in that that when we're talking about rights and data, we need we need to be clear about what, we're, what it is we're talking about here in terms of whether it's the structure, whether it's the contents of that, that database, and then where that data has come from, because it can come from different places. And each each of those sources may be subject to, to different rights in terms of someone already owning IP in that, or uh, there being personal data in that, or it being 
newly created, in which case the creator of that will own the IP. And sorry, commercially licensed data is, is the last one there. And I, I did want to talk a bit more about data protection laws because I think that's kind of quite an important one to, to work through. So data protection laws apply to um, the use of information that relates to an identifiable living individual. So if if the individual in question is dead, then data protection law doesn't apply to that, uh, that data. Um, and the person needs to be identifiable from that. Now that doesn't mean it's only limited to names and addresses and telephone numbers. Any unique identifier which can identify a specific individual is, is personal data. So that may potentially include things like IP addresses um, or other identifiers used online, um, unique reference numbers, things like that are all potentially identifying an individual. So it's, it's quite important when we talk about anonymizing and, and pseudonymizing data to be clear about what's actually involved here, because if data has been genuinely anonymized and such you can't identify that individual anymore, then it will be outside scope of data protection law. But if it's only been what we call pseudonymized, that is, you've done something to it, but you can still identify that individual, then data protection law will, will still apply to what you're doing there. So it's quite important when, when you're dealing with personal data that you understand what the information is and whether that person can be ident identified and what steps you're taking if you want to actually anonymize it, you can actually take to genuinely anonymize that information. There are different rules in, under data protection law depending whether you're dealing with what we call personal data, which is the, the broadest category, or special category personal data. So that's data that relates to health or to um, religious beliefs or um, sexuality or membership of a trade union party or um, political uh, affiliations, that kind of thing. And there are stricter rules that apply to that, which I'll, I'll talk a bit about in the next slide. But with all personal data, there are a series of principles which you need to follow. And this is what all, all data protection law is built on. So the first one is that whatever you're doing needs to be fair and lawful and transparent. So fairness is, is you know, what you're doing is fair and, and not unreasonable. Lawful, you've got to have a legal basis for that. We'll talk a bit about that. And transparent means that you've been clear with the individual about what, what you're doing with their data. We have the purpose limitations. So that means if you collect data for one purpose, then you can't use it for another purpose that's incompatible with that original purpose. Um, so if I, if I collect data for, um, uh, say, to um, service a customer, um, I may not then be able to use that for uh, something like um, certain types of marketing without having told the individual I'm going to do that. So being clear about what, what those purposes are, not, not using that purposes are incompatible. There are exemptions around research, which are, are quite helpful um, uh, and can, can be relied upon for, for research projects. Data minimization, so that is that you only collect the uh, amount of data you need that's necessary for the, the purpose. You're not collecting more than is necessary. Um, so you shouldn't collect as much as possible just before you, because you can, and that can sometimes be a pro problem with using big data. Uh, accuracy, you have a duty to keep the data accurate and um, where appropriate up to date. Now that doesn't mean to say that if you have a, a database that is several years old, you have to contact someone five years down the line and check the information hasn't changed. Um, it, 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 there are limits to the, the, the obligation to keep it up to date, but you do have an obligation to keep it accurate and to correct that if someone tells you that the information that you hold about them isn't, isn't accurate. Storage limitations, so you shouldn't hold that data for longer than it's necessary for the purpose. Um, so once that purpose is passed, it should be deleted or destroyed. Uh, data security, you keep that data secure. And then we have a, a, a final principle here, and this, this is one which came in under GDPR a couple of years ago, and that's the accountability principle. And that is that the, the controller um, has to be able to demonstrate compliance with all of this. So it's, it's not enough just now to actually comply with the law. You now have to show how you're complying with it and show that you're able to comply with it. And this is this was a big challenge to everyone when GDPR came in because a lot of organizations kind of broadly complied to data protection law, but not necessarily because they had done that through, it was more accident by design. Um, and quite often things would be justified retrospectively if someone complained about it and you, it would all be fine. But with the accountability uh, principle, you know, organizations now have an obligation from the outset to be able to show that they are 
processing data in accordance with the law. So that means showing that they have policies and procedures in place, um, showing that they have training in place for, for staff, um, that they have data retention policies that are being adhered to, they're carrying out internal auditing, all that kind of stuff. So some of the key issues with um, that come up in a compliance um, for a compliance perspective with, with data projects. So first of all, I mentioned you, you have to have a legal basis. Um, if you're not processing special category personal data, then you have a choice. Um, uh, there's a number of principles, uh, so um, legal basis. So that might be that it is uh, necessary for you to comply with the legal obligation. It might be because you are a public body and it's it's to help you do a task that you're carrying out in public interest. It might be because it's being carried out in the base of your legitimate interests. So that's something that's reasonable for you to do and doesn't unduly impact on privacy or, or the rights of the individual. And if you can't then find a legal basis for one of those, then you might fall back in consent. But we always leave consent to the end of the, the list because that's the one that you, you want to be relying upon the least. If you have another legal basis, it's much better to rely upon that um, because consent can be withdrawn. And if you rely upon consent and someone withdraws consent, then um, you can no longer process that data. And getting consent may also be problematic in, in certain situations. If you're processing special category personal data, then there are, um, as I said, additional um, legal bases that you need to identify, and they are much narrower and much stricter. Um, I'm not going to go into those in detail, but they, they are set out in, in Schedule 1 of the Data Protection Act, if, if you want to have a look at those. The second issue, and this comes up quite a lot with data projects, so understanding who is the controller and who's the processor. So the controller is the, the legal entity that decides how and why personal data is being processed. Um, and that could be one in one party, or it could be um, two or more parties acting together, in which case they are joint joint controllers. So it's always important at the outset to understand you know, who are the, who's the controller, um, is it one or more parties, um, and who is uh, responsible for what's actually being done. You might also engage a third party to, to do some processing, um, uh, and they are they're called a processor, and they have to process only on the instruction of the the controller, and they have a narrower set of obligations under under data protection law, but there are requirements in terms of what you put in your contract with that party. Privacy notice, so you need to issue privacy notices explaining what data is being processed, for what purpose, um, what your legal basis is, who you are, and how an individual can exercise their, their rights. So you need to think about how those are drafted, how you ensure they're accurate, and how they're issued to individuals. If you're sharing data, then you want to think about how that's dealt with. So what's the basis for that? Where's your data coming from? who you're sharing it with, how you're ensuring it's being used properly. If you're using AI for automated decision making, then you also need to be aware of the, the additional rules that apply in that as well. So there are particular rules where automated, where a decision is made solely on the basis of automated means, and it has a legal effect on that individual or a similarly significant effect. Um, so that is kind of things like, you know, making a decision whether someone can enter the country for immigration purposes or perhaps whether it's offered insurance policy or something like that. But, but there are many decisions out there where AI could be used that have that impact. And if that's the case, then individuals have rights to understand how that decision is being made and to challenge it in certain situations. And that's quite difficult with AI and quite often no one really quite knows how the black box actually works and how the decision is being made. How, how do you explain that? Uh, data subjects have rights under data protection law, so we'll all be familiar with the right of subject access, um, also the right of uh, the right to be forgotten or the, the right of erasure has had quite a lot of press, but there are other rights as well to object to processing or to restrict the way in which your data has been processed. So you need to think about how those are managed. A lot of them aren't absolute rights, so they're qualified, so they may require some thought as to where they apply. Um, and then the, the other point according here is around transfers outside the, the UK or the EA, which I know was was covered in the previous session. And there's been um, a number of cases in the courts in recent years on international transfers and what can and can't be done under um, EU and now UK data protection law. Uh, so one to be aware of if, if you're hosting or transferring data outside uh, the UK or the EU. And then the final point, and something again, which has, has been good practice in the UK for a number of years, but GDPR um, put into writing is, is carrying a data protection impact assessment. So that's doing a risk assessment on the project you're carrying out with personal data. So 
trying to identify what the risks are and then the steps that you can take to mitigate those risks. What can you do about that to, to mitigate them? Um, is, is the, pro, is the um, processing lawful um, and recording all your steps? And going back to the accountability principle, carrying a DPIA is, is a very helpful way of actually showing that you've you've actually thought about all this stuff because you can provide a document that shows, shows all you're working on this. Okay, so that follows on quite nicely to data stewardship. And th this is something, again, a term which is we're seeing quite a lot. Um, and there was a report from the Ada Lovelace Institute and AI Council, which was published um, last month. And it tried to define data stewardship. So it says it's the responsible use collection and management of data in a participatory and rights preserving way. And the, the report identifies a number of a number of issues, a number of challenges. So firstly, that there's clearly issues of trust, um, which come out of a number of high profile data breaches that we've had in recent years, and other scandals involving the sharing of data or use of data for purposes that weren't, weren't terribly transparent. And that then touches on things like power imbalances. So individuals have very few in a very weak position versus a large organization with lots of data that they hold in terms of how that's done and there is this power power imbalance I mentioned lack, lack of transparency and i think that the uh, report specifically calls out um public private sector partnerships where you've got the private sector and the public sector in particular you know, the nhs um carrying out projects involving the use of data where there's not a huge amount of transparency and this question is to you know who defines what is good. So the the parties involved in the in the project to actually um, process the data might think it's it's good and it has um is worth doing, but what do the individuals think about that and how how do you deal with who who defines what is good there? Um and I suppose it's also you know, it's looking at personal data management, but some of the principles here are equally applicable to projects involving non-personal data as well. And what what the report then looks at is some of the legal mechanisms that we could use to manage some of this um, and which one might work will, will depend on the, the nature of the project in question. But there, there's a, a three different um, concepts which the report identifies. So one of them is around data trust and this is using trust law to um, have trustees who are responsible for exercising the rights granted in data on behalf of beneficiaries. So individuals will provide their data to the trust on, on a certain basis and it's up to the trustees then to, to use that data and to, to process it um, and exercise those rights. But it, it's creating a distinction between the individuals to whom the data relates and the beneficiaries and having someone in the middle um, who will have particular duties and how that, that data is being used. So quite, quite a novel idea and what what this is trying to do is, is deal with that imbalance of power by by separating out the interests of the individual from the the beneficiaries or the other parties that want to use it. The second concept that's talked about is something called data cooperatives. So in a data cooperative, the idea is you would have members who would come together in a cooperative and they would pool their data in some form of commonly owned enterprise. And that cooperative would then steward the data so they would look after it they would decide what was done with it for the benefit of the members and that sort of model we you know we can see working where you have members who want an equal stake um and direction uh, a direct input into into decision making so everyone has a part to play in that they have a vote that counts in terms of deciding how the data is being used so in those situations a cooperative model might, might work and then the final one that they identify is using corporate or contractual mechanisms. And this, I suppose, is the one that is most familiar and, and tends to be the one that's been used most to date. But the idea here is you know, if you're using a contractual model, that you have some form of standardized data sharing agreement, either um, between two parties or between all parties. You could have a sort of um, deed of adherence that everyone signs up to, setting out the rules, or a corporate model where you instead establish some form of new legal entity and that is the entity that actually manages the database, the database, the data set and, and what is, is done with it. So some quite innovative work in terms of thinking about how, how we can deal with some of these challenges and what what frameworks can be used to actually um, try and address some of the, the challenges that, uh, that the Institute had addressed. And, and they give an example, and this is one that I picked out from the, the appendix in the document, but um, there's something called Safe Havens, which is, 
used by Scottish NHS trusts um, as a way to provide access to um, patient records. So there are, I think, five of these safe havens and they're designed for providing access to anonymized electronic patient records and they provide an environment where researchers can analyze that data in a secure way. But the data then never leaves the environment. So it's always under the control of the haven. And there's a charter setting out the rules um, in terms of what can be done with that and how that's accessed. There's an approval process for anyone getting access to it. And each haven has its own individual responsibility. But it's it's, it's cited as a, a good way of providing a sort of sandbox or, or a way for researchers to get access to data, um, but in a way that keeps it secure and avoids it being duplicated or potentially compromised um, by going outside the, the, uh, the environment. Okay, so the, the next bit, I, I just want to talk about um, how we manage some of these, these risks that we talked about in, in practice. <clears throat> and so I, I go back to my little database diagram, I thought it might be useful just to give an example of what might be in a database you know, that you're dealing with. So you may have um, information that comes from public sector data that might be on the basis of an OGL license, or it might be from say, Ordin Survey or Met Office and it, it's licensed on, on very specific terms. Um, you may have personal data in there. You might have some proprietary information um, from your own organization or another that might be confidential. And you may have new data, which has been derived from analysis of all of this. And then the question is, in terms of that output, what can you do with it? And as I said, you know, if, if you have data within this data set, which is, um, say, licensed on, on the OGL, then your ability to license the output to a third party will be dependent on that that input license. You can't give someone greater rights to the, the output data than you've got to the bits that come into, into your organization or into, into the project. And mapping data is a really good example of this, where you know, we might license mapping data from the ordinance survey, and then we might layer other information on top of that. And the license terms you grant to a third party, you're, you will be subject to whatever terms the ordinance survey has imposed on you in terms of the underlying mapping data as to what you can allow third parties to do. So. One of the things I find really useful in these sort of projects is actually to try and draw it out and understand all the inputs to it, the license terms to apply to that, to then work out <clears throat> what's actually in there, um, who owns what, what if anything is new, if this new stuff, is it derived data, in which case it might still belong to one of your licensing partners, or is it new stuff that you now own? And then when you're making that available to third parties or publishing it, what's being published? Is it just the newly created stuff or is it actually a layered database or some form of um, output that has data from lots of different sources? And so this takes me on to how you manage the risks. So, you know, the, the real important thing here is, is carrying out your diligence and doing your planning in terms of the, the project. So thinking about what data sources you have, what data you're creating, how you can structure the project and the collaboration why you're doing it. So are you doing it just for research purposes? Are you doing it to publish something? Are you doing it to commercialize and exploit it? Um, in which case, what, what's your model for that? And then thinking about how you mitigate those risks. So as part of this, you'll be looking at the data. So have you got what types of data in there? Is it personal data, special category personal data? In which case you may, you know, you think about data protection law. Is data anonymized or can it be anonymized? In which case you can perhaps de-risk some of the data protection compliance. If it's non-personal personal data, then is it confidential? In which case you need to deal with that? Or is it publicly available? So understanding your data source is really important. Likewise, the provenance of the data. So <clears throat> where's it actually coming from? Is it a public data set, which may be fairly free for you to use? Um, is it licensed on strict licensing conditions? Is it coming from within your organization? Is it um, research, in which case is it academic or is it commercial? Have you got multiple parties involved in the project? in which case who owns what data has been created or is it jointly owned in some way? And what about the, the automated data creation? So you may have analytics, um, you may have sensor data or, or whatever. And then thinking about how that data will be used. So why, why are you doing this? What, what rights might be acquired? Um, think about those, think about if you're going to be data sharing, then what are you sharing? And with whom and for what purpose and it's particularly important with with personal data being, being clear if you are sharing personal data with another organization 
are they a controller? Are they a processor? Are they a joint controller? And um, what are you allowing them to do to, to do with that data? Because the act of sharing the data is processing itself. So you need to be confident that what you're doing is is lawful in terms of sharing with that other organization. You want to think about access terms. So who has access to that? Is it controlled or is it uncontrolled? Um, might you lock down certain bits of data compared to others? Um, will it be on a, a commercial basis or, or free to use? Um, and say, you know, commercialization versus versus academic freedom. And thinking about, are you improving what what you're, the data you're getting? Are you repackaging it some way or doing something something new and interesting with it? And so there's lots of ways you can try and mitigate your risks here. So I say the important thing, first of all, is to analyze all the sources and understand those those IP rights. So what, what IP is in the data that you're getting access to? Um, understanding the license terms, um, really important just to know because they said what you can do with that. And if the license terms you're offered aren't, you know, don't, don't allow you to do what you want to do, then think about going to the licensor and saying, actually, can we change those terms? Because these terms don't work here. Um, I've seen on a number of occasions, organizations provide a license agreement that's just not the right one for the project. So quite often they will have different templates for different purposes and they will send one out um, to a particular person because they think based on the type of organization, that sort of license is required, but actually it's not the right one and doesn't allow the parties to do what's actually intended. So it, it's important to actually read the terms and make sure you've got, got the right ones. Uh, from a data protection perspective, you know, look at the type of data. If you can anonymize it and work with anonymized data, that's much better. Um, if not, you're going to have to think about your legal basis and conduct your data protection impact assessment. And if you are getting data provided by third parties, you know, look at those terms of use and the license scope. Um, look at the, understand what responsibilities the provider has to you, and you might want to put in some some warranties or some contractual promises in that document in terms of. Um, you know what you, what you can do, what you can rely upon in the data that you that you get, um, so you know that you are comfortable using it for your, your preferred purpose. When it comes to exploitation and use, um, again, so thinking about what what rights are being created, and then thinking about how you assert those rights. So if there's newly created IP, and it's potentially uh, you know it might be registrable in some way, um, then who's actually going to seek register protection? Which party does that? Um, is it you or, or someone else? And what do you do about potential infringement? So how do you stop someone else misusing it? Who's responsible for that? Um, who will grant licenses to use or access the data? Um, so who will do that and what terms are they on? And understanding, as I say, this really important point about ensuring that your, your outbound terms back to back with the inbound terms that you've got. So you're not granting more rights than you actually have and potentially putting you in breach of that, that original license agreement. And in terms of project structuring, so um, if you're collaborating with third parties, you know, this is a key part of all of this. So if you are dealing with um, institutions, so higher further education, then their approach to risk uh, will be very different to industry, uh, which will be different again in turn to the public sector. You may have all, all three or four in, in a particular project. So how, how do you allocate risk? How do you know who's doing what? Um, how do you identify ownership of IP? Um, how do, so what, what you're doing around what each party can do with the, with the output from that. So different parties might need the data for different purposes and do different things with it. So the, the in, institution might want to publish you know, the academic research. They may want to use it for further research. Industry might want to commercialize the output. The public sector may may have uh, you know, something else they want to do with that. So it's important at the outset to be clear on all of this stuff. And say with, with personal data, you know, potentially you have issues around um, joint controllership where the, you have more than one party that's responsible for compliance, in which case you need to actually map out who's responsible for um, ensuring compliance, who, who deals with data subject requests, who's responsible for um, keeping the data secure. And with all of this, you know, the best thing to do is to set all this out in some form of collaboration or, or project agreement that ensures all the parties are clear on what, they're, what they can and can't do. And then on data security, so uh, again, who's responsible for managing um, security and controlling access? If there's personal data, then the, the important thing to bear in mind here is that when we, when we determine what 
is an adequate level of security for data. It's not based on the likelihood of that data being compromised. It's to do with the risk to the individual if it is compromised. So the expectation in terms of security measures that you have for financial or health information will be much greater than say a marketing database that just has someone's work email address in it. So in the latter example of that database is compromised then the risk to the individual is pretty low. In the in the, the first example, if that database is compromised, then the risk to individual may be may be quite high. So the the expectation in terms of the security measure you have will be that great higher, that bit higher for the first example. And so that you then, if you're using a third party to host it, you want to ensure that you've done your diligence on the hosting environment, the um, the structure of the database, the access controls, etc. And you want to ensure that you test that and review those on a on a regular basis. If it's been hosted offshore, then um, as, as we talked about, there are some issues around international transfers, particularly if there are transfers to the US, um, which make it quite difficult at the moment, given given recent case law, um, if you're hosting data there. So that, that's something that's going to require an additional assessment on, on compliance. And then finally, just you know, around ensuring that you document and you agree what those information security requirements are, so you have a common understanding of what what's been done with that. And, and this is all good practice, regardless of whether personal data is involved or not. You know, if there is potentially sensitive IP in there or confidential information, you want to ensure that it's kept kept secure as well. So that is just about me. I just wanted to finish off um, with some final recommendations before we go to uh, any, any questions that we have. Um, so what are my key recommendations? Well, uh, you know, carrying out due diligence at the outset of a project is, is absolutely key to identify you know, all these risks and work out how you manage them. And if you are potentially using personal data, then carry a data protection impact assessment and review and update that assessment as the project develops because it's, um, it's pretty, I'm pretty, you know, it's, it's, it's in, well, at the outset of the project, what you're doing will likely evolve as, as time goes on. Um, and what you don't want to do is have your impact assessment being based on information that becomes out of date. So make sure you keep that up to date and, and review it. Um, be aware of the rights that exist in, in publicly available information. So yes, they are great sources of information, but they are quite often subject to um, specific rules and how they can be used. And some of those are quite permissive, but some of them also may restrict what you want to do with that information. Um, ensure that you, you can label the provenance information. So internally, you understand where, where the data comes from. Um, what rules apply to it, what restrictions apply to its use, so you don't end up inadvertently breaching those licenses um, by doing something that data that you shouldn't be doing or making it available to someone that shouldn't have access to it. And, and think at the outset, you know, what, what you want to do with the, the output of this data or the information, because if you can think at the, at the outset about that, then it's much easier to plan to ensure you're actually able to achieve that. And that, that involves a bit of crystal ball gazing in terms of thinking about what you want to do, but the more you can do that, the better. And then you know, build appropriate steps and controls into each stage of, of this process. So you know, auditing your sources, um, looking at the licenses, um, carrying out security and access controls, um, reviewing it at a regular basis is, is really important. And if you're collaborating with third parties, have, have clear rules in place and just keep on reviewing and, and auditing your, your compliance. And that was um, all I wanted to, to say. Much, Martin. It was such a rich talk, and uh, it was very interesting to see how, how all these issues uh, become relevant when we are constructing and operating in, in a digital environment. It was very, very interesting. Thanks very much. And uh, we already have a, a number of interesting questions as well from the audience. And I would like to now open um, the QA part. Um, So uh, one of the questions uh, relating to ownership of uh, the intellectual property, that was something you also mentioned when, while you are um, exploring around mitigating the risk. So if high rate data from multiple sources is drawn together and the relationship uh, established, who actually owns that IP? And perhaps the relationship might permit substantial substantive financial gain. So would you like to elaborate on that question a bit further? 
Yeah, so it, 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 I'm going to give the, the classic lawyer's answer of it depends, um, and I'll then elaborate that in a bit more detail. So if it, it, it as I tried to sort of show in that, that diagram, you know, if, if you have a database which comprises data from different sources, then each of those parties that provides that data will continue to own that part of the data is in there. So you would use it on the basis of a license, which is a contractual permission to use that data. Um, and that's why it's really important to understand where, what your sources are and what applies to that. And then also trying to work out what, it, what, what is new and being created, because it may not be the case that what you create using that data is actually IP that you own. And there may be two reasons for that. One of it, it may just be a sort of a, um, a derivative of the inbound um, data. So there's nothing really new, it's just an evolution of that, in which case it belongs to the, the original provider. Or it may actually be that the license conditions that apply to your use of it say, well, anything you do with that, you will own, sorry, we will own, and therefore you don't own it. Um, so it, it's a very difficult one to answer in the abstract, but it, it is the absolute key question here. And that's why, you know, trying to map this out um, and having a clear understanding of what, what your sources are, who owns that data, what's then being added to it or done with it, and then working out what's new and then what you want to do with it is, is, is really important. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. And the next question is relating to citizen science. What are your views on rights in data? generated by citizen science. Um, can you clarify what you mean by citizen science in, in that sense? Yeah, I wonder whether, um, Rob, would you like to follow up and elaborate on the question? Sorry, yes, um, I know I, so this is Ron here. I gave a very general question. Um, so citizen science in uh, a lot of the digital environment now, we co-opt uh, citizens in collecting data for, uh, for scientific results, so uh, ecology, biodiversity data, or water quality data, or air quality data. A good example is where they put air quality monitors on the back of children as they walk to school, and then you collect that data. Um, and I've, I've always been very curious on um, exactly, you know, what the various rights and obligations are on the data gathered, because they're not being gathered by the scientists, they're being gathered by the citizens. As such, um, you know, the residual rights of those individual citizens um, that need to be taken into consideration. Yeah, so that, that's a really good question, and I suppose you know, the, the first first point here is that the from an IP perspective, there's unlikely to be much IP in what each individual person creates. So it may not actually be that the, you know the individual. Um, sense of readings from that individual actually create anything and query whether they are the one that's actually creating that if, if it's a sensor is deployed by someone else you know, they own that sensor um i don't know that each individual person would would really own very much in that um i've looked at this bizarrely in in the agricultural context where sensors have been used you know in, in farms and things like this you know to track cattle and things it's come up before and and the way they usually deal with it is actually just to say you know whatever um agreement you have with the individuals taking part in it is just to say, you know, to be clear, any any IP that does exist in this, we we will we will own and you don't actually um own that. But, but I think there'd be very unlikely to be much IP in it. What what you do need to be particularly aware of those is um data protection because if you are tracking an individual in terms of their movements, um then you will be building up information that's related relates to an individual. And I go back to a point there around, you know, to what extent can you anonymize that data such that you can't identify that it was Martin who was um, carrying that sensor and this represents you know, Martin's walk to work or, um, you know, whatever he was doing. Um, so I think that, that again, it kind of depends on what, what information is actually being collected. But it, you know, what you probably want to do is as soon as possible is try and anonymize that data in some way that reduced the ability to associate it with a particular individual um, and then that means that you are uh, less beholden to data protection laws in terms of what you can actually do with that data. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Martin. Um, another question is that it's becoming more common for academic journals to request data to be made publicly accessible via an uh, open access database. And given many of these open access databases 
not have contractual warranties in terms of infringement protections. What rights does the researcher have if their data is downloaded from an open access database and used for a purpose that's different to which it was intended? Yes, again, another good question. I think you know, there's a, a difference, well, the two things here. One is you know, the rights to stop that if, if you don't want, want it to happen. And I suppose you would need to know who was actually downloading it um, to do that. And I don't know whether the um, the the database or repository would enable you to track that. Um, but if you know, it, uh, clearly that there's potential attention in terms of whether you can do that. And we talked about the reason why that might be the case, but um, you, you would want to try and understand who was getting access to it or perhaps try and impose some license terms on what they can do with it. Mm -hmm. And then the second issue is around the liability of the researcher or the researcher's employer. You know, if you've signed up to a license agreement and you have inbound data from a third party, then actually whether whether you are permitted to do that and whether actually sharing that data on that basis potentially puts you in breach of those those license terms. Um, so I think again it's something that if, if if you're asked to do that, you need to be clear whether or not it's something you are you're actually able to do as, as a matter of law. Mm. Yes, thanks very much. Um, the next question is about licensing. Is there a point whereby the derived data is so far removed from the original data that the license no longer holds? Uh, yes, so that that can be the case. So you you can you know do just enough with it that it um, ceases to be relevant to the original data. It very much depends on the on the context. But yes, the, the short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. And I was also wondering, Martin, uh, you have been doing uh, a lot of practical work. How much awareness um, there is out there in terms of you know all these issues relevant to digital environment or digitalization? I, I think that the answer to that is that there are certain sectors who are much better, are much more aware of it than others. Um, I've done quite a lot of work um, in relation to the, the public sector with clients who are, you know, say, for example, of um, compiled sort of statutory databases and things like that, where they take data sources and they have to make available information, um, particularly in the environmental sector. Um, and that, that's a really interesting one because you've got your data coming in, mapping data, you've got meteorology data, you've got other sorts of data like that. Um, and it, it's a real minefield to actually understand all the different aspects to it, because you've got all that input data, you've got what's been done with it to actually create the database. But then you've then got, um, you know, ac academic researchers getting access to it to then do other things with it. You've got information made available to the public um, through a portal, you've got um, you know, subcontractors doing other things with it. And it, it's an incredibly complex area to try and get your head around, um, particularly when you're dealing with you know, things like the OGL or the NCGL and um, you know, various overlays of, of statutory duties in addition to uh, the, the commercial or, or academic pressures existing within a university. So mm -hmm. um, it, it is something I think is, there's been a lot more awareness since 2015 regulations came along. Um, mm -hmm and uh, a lot more people asking for access to data from public bodies and um, so I think people are becoming more more aware of it but um, we still do see from time to time you know projects where the issues haven't been thought about at the outset and mm -hmm. the license terms some of have don't actually allow them to do what they want to do and they're in a bit of a, a stuck situation. Mm -hmm. Yes thanks very much. Yeah. Um, I think this brings us to the end of our, uh, our webinar thanks very much for and Martin for this really fascinating and interesting talk and thank you very much everyone for joining us today and uh, we hope to see everyone again for our next webinar on the uh, 29th of April and we will welcome Natalia Domeniola who is uh, the head of data ethics at the cabinet office government digital service and we will explore issues around uh, data ethics the framework so thanks very much everyone and hope to see you all by then.